Welcome to Digging Deeper into Spiritual Practices, a Spiritual Seedlings interview with Nancy Flinchbaugh. I am the author of several books, including Awakening, a Contemplative Primer on Learning to Sit. I want my readers to have opportunities to learn more about the spiritual practices discussed in my book. So I'm interviewing some contemplative experts. Today, I'm interviewing Brother Emil of Taze about contemplative worship and the wonderful Taze community, which is located in a rural area in southeastern France. This community has been welcoming people to pray and work for justice and peace since World War II. Brother Emil himself has lived there for 40 years and is one of 100 monks who devote their lives to prayer and this amazing community of love, which welcomes thousands of visitors each year. Good morning. I'm Nancy Flinchball with Spiritual Seedlings. And this morning, I am so excited to be interviewing Brother Emile from the religious community of Taze in a small town in Northern France. I've enjoyed so much the contemplative worship using the Taze prayer chants and in my life. And I have a dream of visiting Taze someday. So this is the next best thing to being there is talking with Brother Emile this morning who has devoted his life to this ministry. So I have some questions about Taze, but I um, would like to start by asking you, um, where did you grow up and how did you make the decision to come to Taze? Yeah, so I grew up in Canada, uh, in Northern Ontario, and I, I first heard of Taze in the early 1970s. Um, Taze was already quite popular with young people at that time. And uh, there was a small gathering of young adults organized in my hometown in the north of Ontario. I was invited to go and I have no reason why I was invited, but uh, but it was a, a rediscovery of, of, uh, of faith, of prayer, and it made me want to go to Taizé for a week, uh, as many people do, uh, many young adults and, and also adults of other ages uh, come to Taizé. And so I went in 1974 for a week and returned the following year for a full year as a, as a volunteer and then became one of the brothers of the community. We are about 100 brothers. And, uh, and so I joined in 1976 after having lived one full year as a volunteer. And so I've, I've been there for yeah, about 45 years, 45 years. Wow. OK, well, thanks for sharing that. I think I first entered, um, learned about Taze when I lived in Iowa, probably in the early 80s, and a brother came to lead a retreat at the church I was attending there in, in Iowa City, Iowa. So I've a little later than you, but I never got to go to France like you did. But that's that's wonderful. So 40 years you've been there already. That's amazing. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, how did the Taze community begin? Well, Taze um, is a very small village. So it's 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 uh, it's not quite the north of France, but it's the uh, the center east. You could say we're just two okay. hours away from Geneva by car. Uh, Lyon would be the closest major city. Uh, 100 or 60 miles north of Lyon. It's okay. Burgundy, French Burgundy, um, a very isolated village. And Taizé started uh, as a community during the Second World War, at the very beginning of the Second World War, 1940. Our founder, uh, whose name is Roger, he became Brother Roger, um, was interested in community life. He felt that what people were waiting for today was not more words about faith and hope, but, it, but they were looking for ways of living it, ways of of embodying it. And so he, he thought community is all about that. Community is all about living uh, a sign. So he was drawn to community life. He had studied a monastic life uh, as a young man, um, but he didn't want to restore something of the past. He didn't want restoration of a form of life that goes back to the Middle Ages, but he wanted to draw from the, the wisdom of these early monastic communities and have a community that would be for, for people as they are today, with their questions, with their difficulties, and and uh, and also wanting to listen to people. Brother Roger didn't want to so much to preach to people as to listen and, and walk with them, uh, help them find their own answers. And so he was looking for a house where he could start that. So he was born in Switzerland. He could have found a house in Switzerland. Switzerland was neutral during the Second World War. It would have been easier to remain in his native land, but he chose to come to France. France was at war. There were many refugees. And he thought uh, one of the signs that the gospel is authentic in someone's life 
is is if it opens you up to the poor and those who are in need, those who are in distress, and that you know that it's not an escape, you're not running away if the gospel leads you to, to solidarity with the poor. And so he said, I want to find a house where I can do that. So he was on his bicycle, he left Switzerland, pedaled his bicycle uh, all the way to France and found me, found a house for sale uh, in the small village of Taizé and, and he bought it in 1940. He was just 25 years old. Uh, but it was uh, he bought it in faith, and uh, he was alone for two years. He gave refuge to Jewish refugees um, who were escaping the Nazi persecutions. He himself was forced to uh, stay away from Tezea. Uh, in 1942, the Gestapo came here. Fortunately, he was not present at that time. The Gestapo came, the German military police, and uh, he was not able to come back until 1944. And he was then joined with a few young men who wanted to live the same life. And that's how the Tese community started. And it, it grew over the years and it drew people from different churches, Catholics and Protestants. So it's a, that's why we say it's an ecumenical community, a community of, composed of people from many different Christian origins who want to work for unity, not uniformity. Diversity is a good thing, but unity, not using diversity as a pretext to for division, but live a, a sign of unity, as Jesus said, no, there will be, people will believe mm -hmm. that, that if people, if he, he prays to his father, no, let them be one so that the world may believe that there's a, when there's a unity between people who are very different, people sense there's something of God. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to, he wanted to live that. So that's the first part of the story of Tese is this small group of men uh, trying to live a monastic life. And then there's a whole new chapter that starts in the end of the 50s, early 60s, and that we are still in today, uh, it's when young adults started coming in large numbers to Tese. You know, it's normal for it's normal for communities to have guests, monastic communities have always practiced hospitality. But with Brother Roger, um, there was a closeness. He was close to many young people in the 50s and 60s who were searching for a different type of society, who were not pleased with the inequalities, with the injustice in society. and they would come to Tese. Some, some came because they knew it was a community where there was prayer, where there was reading of the gospel and trying to live it today, but they also were coming because they had a uh, hopes for change in, in the world and uh, felt that Tese was about change also. So Brother Roger welcomed them and he took, he went to great lengths to welcome them. Uh, and we're talking about large numbers that were sometimes up to 5,000 people there the same week uh, and so that meant putting up tents and finding with very little money, finding food for everyone to be able to live a few days at Tese. And that has continued really since the 60s. It's, it's continued until this day. And uh, now with the pandemic, we, we cannot have large numbers, but we are waiting for that to be over to, to continue this life where we, we accompany people. They come and uh, I guess we'll have a chance to talk about that, but they, 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 they come mostly for a week uh, from Sunday to mm -hmm. Sunday. So the... So I always heard it was started after World War I to pray for peace, but it's really a much deeper mission of solidarity and starting something in France during the war was a very scary time, I'm sure, for most people in France because they yes. all, all yes. World War II, of but... course, uh, World War II is, uh, was a time when, when uh, there was also, I think, among many people, um, the intuition maybe that uh, a very individualistic way of living was not going to be helpful, no? mm -hmm. uh, and that we had to look for different ways of, of being together and uh, not looking for what's easy. Now, it's, a straight, it's very counter-cultural, it doesn't go with the culture very much, but Brother Roger used to say a lot, where things are too easy, there's no creativity. He mm -hmm. felt that we are creative when we are facing a challenge, hmm? we are facing a challenge, and for him, welcoming refugees and then later on welcoming young people was a way of facing some of the challenges uh, of today. Well, that's beautiful and it is a challenge to try to follow the gospel in today's mm. world. <laughs> you know, mm. It's more important than ever, you know, I think for your ministry. So tell me about the community's prayer, how that's changed over the years as the number of visitors has grown. Yeah, so I mentioned that there was a kind of rootedness in the monastic tradition. So, you know, monks, monks, um, we all have maybe different mental pictures of what monks are about. Some imagine people with hoods walking in medieval cloisters. And uh, that's not what Tese is about. They're, 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 but basically, 
the monastic community is people who choose to live together and pray together and work together. And, uh, and so that meant uh, having a prayer. Uh, prayer was central, as in all monastic communities. So there was morning, midday, and evening prayer. And as is the case for many communities, we prayed with the Psalms, the Book of Psalms, the, 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 which were the prayers really of the people of the Bible. Jesus prayed them as well. We know in the Gospels, we are told that he prayed the Psalms. And uh, we had some hymns. Uh, at the community were, is composed, I told you, of Protestant and Catholic brothers. And so there were these beautiful hymns from the Protestant tradition that were, that were sung. Uh, Catholic brothers came along afterwards. They brought some of the richness of their own tradition. And it was a beautiful prayer, but it didn't really um, allow people who were there just for a few days to really take an active part in the prayer. And so when young adults and other people started coming in large numbers, Brother Roger felt we have to change our style of prayer. And we have to find a, a more simple form of prayer uh, in which people can take part, participate right away, not be, not be spectators to it. And that's how these short chants, which are known as the Teze songs or Teze chants, that's how they started in the mid, just shortly after I came actually in the, in the late 70s, uh, our prayer started to be more and more uh, informed by, by these prayer, by these songs. So instead of having long texts, we had these very short songs that are taken from the gospel, that are taken from the Bible, that are taken from the Christian tradition. And there was repetitive chant. So it's, it's not so usual to have this form of prayer in most of our cultures. Um, it's not unknown completely, but it's unusual sometimes just to repeat a few words, to sing a few words over again. And that, that was a, a, a very um, important for many people who sometimes want to pray, but they have a difficulty focusing. And they say, but I, my mind is caught up with many different problems at home, traffic. Uh, I don't really know if I can sit down and just be quiet and pray for, for half an hour. And, and this repetitive form of chant was a way of, of helping people um, enter into a more meditative style of prayer. So that was, I think, the biggest change in our prayer was that, 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 that we've always had silence. Silence has always been an important part of the prayer. But mm -hmm. the, these short songs, that was something, that was something new. That's sort of a mantra of sorts, you know, like I meditate, but I also love Taze worship because yeah. you get into those very deeply spiritual chants that have a lot of meaning. And then it's also a time of just focusing and letting go of thoughts and being in God's presence. And being in God's beautiful. presence, which is a very good definition of prayer, really, you know, just being in God's presence, just being yeah. there. And so silence is also really important in the prayer at Taze. So can you talk a little bit about that what what the silence is yeah well if you think if you think of thousands of young people gathered in our church to, at Tese every every week every day three times a day you can imagine the surprise it is for a young person of today uh suddenly there's silence no for seven eight minutes three times a day can you imagine the first time no <laughs> people are used to always having something in their ears or always having some type of sound suddenly there is silence and it terrifies some people. Silence can be mm -hmm. terrifying. No? And the same people who are terrified by the silence are often those who will be the most grateful for it at the end of their week. Because mm -hmm. they, they've discovered that ah, I too can pray. It's not only for people who know lots about spirituality or who know lots about uh, theology or the Bible, but I too can pray with my tiny little bit of trust in God, with my it's just a few simple words. I can be in God's presence. I can be still. When we do silence, it's because we believe that God wishes to speak to us. God's, God is speaking. It's a form of trust in the fact that God wants to be in touch with us. So we don't just, we don't just repeat words, but we allow God's presence to come to us. And silence is a form of welcome, really. It's, it's saying, I'm there. Opening, opening your heart, opening your mind, uh, welcoming God present. So this has uh, really, I think, been an important part uh, of the experience of Tizé for many people is, uh, is the, the prayer, uh, not only with the songs, but, but with the silence and, and, and the readings, of course, when the, the silence come after, comes after the readings. So the, the reading can continue to echo in your heart during, during the silence. And then during your worship, you don't have a sermon or a homily. And, um, no, uh, and no. Often Brother that. Roger, Brother Roger would often just say a short prayer uh, at the end of the prayer. Uh, he would say a short prayer, which would 
it's not a homily, it's not a sermon, uh, it's maybe just in two lines. It's sometimes helpful, sometimes helpful because um, for him, the prayer that he would write himself, it was often a prayer that he would write himself, was a way of helping pe people realize we are welcomed by God with all our complications. We sometimes dream of being, you know, totally transparent, not having any problems, not having any issues, not having any difficulties. Of course, that's not reality. The reality is we come, we come to God with our tiny, tiny ability to focus, but also all our distractions. We come with all our wounds, all our all the, the noise going on inside us, and and then we let God welcome us. And and Brother Roger would write a prayer where I think he would help people understand that you can come to God as you are. You can come to God as you are, and God welcomes us with our complexities, with our complications, and uh, and you don't have to wait to to be changed in order to come to God. So sometimes this kind of prayer can be difficult, and so can you talk a little bit about that and and how what can help us persevere in prayer? Yeah, there is there is the enthusiasm that you can discover. Uh, at the beginning, sometimes about prayer, you know, uh, we see that all the time. Maybe some some of the people listening have been through that. You you are very eager to pray. You, you have this moment where you maybe last months, maybe last years, and then there are deserts. Sometimes, you no, know, there are moments where you no longer feel anything. Uh, maybe you no longer even have the desire to pray for a while. No, that can happen. The early monks knew all about that in the in the early centuries. They had a name for it. You know, this moment where you don't feel like praying, you don't feel like being in God's presence. And often there's a, there's a, people can panic then, no? they can think, oh, I've lost my faith or, or, or that's over for me. Hmm? But it's not really, no, it's normal to go through these moments. And uh, the advantage of a community prayer is that when you're experiencing those difficulties, you can then rely on the prayer of others. No? You allow them to kind of carry you and maybe the next day you are the one who's doing well and you are carrying <laughs> your neighbor eh? your brother or sister and so that's the advantage of community prayers that if we were all alone we might give up on prayer we might give up on prayer and so we we've often encouraged people at Tese not just to pray alone but to mm -hmm. find to find a, a prayer group to find a church to find a that where, where you can pray with others regularly it doesn't mean you don't pray alone but you find also people that you can sustain, you can help, and they can help you when you need time. And, and there's a sign also that is given, of course, by being together. You know, the, the Acts of the Apostles, the, the first uh, community that, that, that the story is told in the Acts, we, it says they were together. You know, they were mm -hmm. together in one place. They shared food, they prayed, uh, they, they listened to the word. So, so that's, that's part of, of, of Christian faith, is to be together, to support one another, to help each other go further. And when things are really difficult, then sometimes we also want to talk with someone. You know? uh, we make mm -hmm. space at Tese for people who want to talk. Um, you know, in the past, sometimes people had words that were quite pompous for these talks. You, know, you were a spiritual director. You were, you were <laughs> but at Tese, Brother Roger preferred a very humble vocabulary. You know, just to listen, to accompany, uh, uh, not give answers necessarily, but to help people realize maybe they don't have to dramatize what they're going through, the difficulty they're going through. They can be patient with themselves, <laughs> patient with God. Um, and, and so it's very valuable, I think, to, to be able to, to talk with someone about your own inner life. Yeah, they all need to be heard. I think that's beautiful. So if somebody would like to visit Taze, how do they arrange that? And how do you get there? Well, we hope that, we hope that soon in a few weeks, maybe, uh, month or so we hope again that it will be possible to come to today we have a business is a website uh, that gives information so it's t-a-i-z-e dot f-r f-r for france uh which has all the information about how to prepare for a week at today it's good to plan to, uh, to an arrival on sunday I'll stay for a full week till the following sunday um there are there's a program for each day for each for the whole week there's a program for each day of the week uh, basically, it's participation in the community prayer. Um, we have a moment where we reflect on scripture together. It's not a, it's not a study as such. It's, you don't have to have lots of knowledge about scripture to come. Uh, it's just people who realize maybe there's a source there. There's a wellspring no? that we can draw from. A word of hope, for example, that we have not produced. Uh, it's not just human optimism, but it has to do with 
God's promise. We need that sometimes. And so, so that's part of the day as well. And then there's sharing that will go on in small groups. Uh, according to age, we kind of group people who are, yeah, under 30. And then people who are, we call them the adult group that are over 30. Uh, they're generally about, in the summer weeks, there are 2,000 people a week, maybe. Two, two 3,000 people a week, uh, maybe 70, 80% of them will be under 30. Um, we also have the youngest you can be as I think is 15, 16. If you're accompanied there, there are groups of teenagers, uh, but most are between the ages of 17 and 30, I would say, and then 30 and above, maybe three, 400 every week. No. Yeah. Well, I do really hope that I can come someday. And so you're hoping mm -hmm. maybe in a, within another month or two, they may allow you to start Yes, Most yes, we, we think that after the 15th of May, we think that it's very possible. We're waiting, of course, for to see how the how the pandemic goes. But uh, we, we've been able to welcome small numbers even through the in many parts of the many, many months of the pandemic. But uh, but now France is in a lockdown, so we, we have stopped for the moment. But we will hope to begin that again soon. Well, thank you so much for this interview. And perhaps I'll meet you someday at Taze after yes. the pandemic. And yes. We so love the Taze form of worship here in Springfield. There are six churches and we take turns preparing a monthly service and have it at each of our churches. And it's a, mm -hmm. a great way to come together, but we've also had to take a break during the pandemic. And I, I keep thinking maybe I could do something online, you know, to kind of tide us over until we can meet in person again, but yes, we yes. can start it again. We've oh, also done some things online this year too, but it, and it's surprising how Oh, I did something for it with Yale uh, just about a month ago with Yale Divinity School, and it was wonderful to pray together online. Yeah. We had to adapt, of course, to the limits of what you can do online. We couldn't really sing together, but we could, we could, uh, someone could sing and the others could listen, and then we could listen to the same text in scripture, we could listen to one person, maybe talk a little bit about the text. And, and so there are many possibilities. We have to be creative right now. Yeah, well, maybe you inspired me to email everybody and try to get something going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you again, and I appreciate your prayerfulness, and thank you for the ministry of Taze. You know, I think solidarity with the poor and working for justice is so important. I think when we go into the silence, God calls us to act. And I'm yes. so thankful yes. for Brother Roger and for all of you. So thank you, Brother Emil. Thank you. Thank you. It's been Wish wonderful. you well. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this interview with Brother Emil of Taze, France. You can learn more about the Taze community on their website at taize.fr, where you can listen to their worship and prayers, get daily prayers and scriptures, and much more. If you're interested in going to Taze, check out the link coming to Taze on their website, where you can find all the information you need to arrange a visit. As Brother Emil said, they are not currently open for visitors, but hope the restrictions will lift soon, maybe as soon as May 2021. So you can check back there to find out. And if you'd like to learn the prayer chants he talked about, you can find them listed alphabetically on the website with the words and also the music. This has been a Spiritual Seedlings interview with Nancy Flinchball. You can find out about meditation and other spiritual practices on my website and in my book, Awakening, a Contemplative Primer on Learning to Sit.